Grace and peace to you and welcome to our Monday Thursday worship service. Let us begin with the sounding of the chimes. As we join together to observe this holy night on which Christ shared his last meal with his disciples, we too will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, just as we did on Palm Sunday. We will do so virtually, so if you haven't already, now is a good time to uh, find a morsel of food that's bread or bread-like and something to drink so that we can all partake together during the sacrament later in the service. And we will have uh, faces that are familiar to you joining us when we take the bread and the cup together to represent that we are truly gathered by the spirit of Jesus into his community, even though we are physically apart from one another. On Friday, there will be a Good Friday service that you can view from our website. It should be up uh, for you to access by noon on Friday. And yes, we will gather virtually for Easter Sunday on the day of resurrection at our usual time at 9.30 in the morning. Let us now continue to worship the Lord our God as we listen to the prelude. our light and our salvation. What shall we fear? The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. Of what shall we be afraid? As we prepare for worship this night, let us come to God in prayer. God of grace and God of glory, as we come to consider once again the great cost that brought us salvation, we ask that you would be with us as we receive your word for us. Prepare our hearts to receive what we are about to hear, to discern your will therein, and to respond to you in faith and obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus in the 12th chapter, the first 14 verses. 
the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall be joined its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb the same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our gospel lesson is from the 13th chapter of John, verses 1 through 35. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, for it is entirely clean. But you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. 
So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in his self, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when I learned this week that two of my childhood friends might be participating in tonight's service, I decided to start my sermon with the very same story I shared last Monday, Thursday with my former church in New Jersey. And the story is from the time of my mother's funeral two years ago. She and my father had raised me and my two brothers in Burlington, North Carolina. My father died there, and several years after that, my mother relocated two hours away to Charlotte to be near my brother Jim. And there she joined a church and lived another eight fruitful years in a new community making new friends. So when she died, we didn't expect that many people from our hometown to make it to the funeral. Most of them called, sent cards, and posted beautiful tributes on Facebook, all of which were deeply appreciated by me and my brothers. But there were six childhood friends who came to the funeral, most of whom we had not seen in years. Three of them grew up with us on our block and still lived in Burlington. And the other three traveled longer distances from North Myrtle Beach, Washington, D.C., and even as far as from Colorado. One of them was Betsy, whose father had been our minister. Another was Laura, a friend of mine from middle school through college. And the third has been a friend of mine since we were about four years old, Lisa, who brought her daughter Annie with her. So when the funeral was over and everyone had returned home, I began to wonder why, from among all of our childhood friends, these six took the extra time and effort to come to the funeral. And then it hit me. Every single one of them had eaten with my family at our kitchen table. Sunday afternoon dinners after church, Saturday night cookouts with steak on the grill and donuts for dessert, spaghetti suppers, and post-sleepover breakfast of Cap'n Crunch, Lucky Charms, and yes, more donuts. Now, my mother's cooking was not particularly spectacular or healthy, but her table was always open. No reservations required. She never worried if there would be enough food or enough space even if we had to set up a card table and extra chairs in the next room, no one was ever turned away. Now, I don't think my mother's hospitality was that unique. I'm sure most of you can name those neighborhood moms who fed you when you were a kid. And maybe you're one of those moms or dads now. 
but seeing those six friends show up in person at my family's time of deep sorrow reminded me never to underestimate the power of welcoming guests to your table. Never lose sight of the bonds you are creating whenever you invite someone into your home for a meal or when you ask a visitor at church to sit beside you after worship in fellowship hall. The food doesn't have to be good because it's not about the food, it's about love. Jesus began his journey of love on an empty stomach. After fasting from food for 40 days by himself in the wilderness, he called disciples to become his friends and to walk with him. And from that moment on, he ate and drank all the way to Jerusalem in the company of all kinds of people, rich and poor, friends and strangers, sinners and self-righteous. He fed people by the thousands to reveal that God's generosity and compassion for us never run out. And in his parables, he used the example of feasting to describe what God's kingdom is like. No doubt Jesus got hungry like we all do. He was fully human. He had to eat. But he never missed an opportunity to share a meal or to accept an invitation to sit at someone's table because by doing that, he brought the kingdom of God into sharper focus, even into our homes. Jesus knew the power of giving and receiving hospitality because he knew it's not about the food. It's about love. That's why it's not a trivial thing that we are grieving all those fellowship meals we were looking forward to for Lent. Now, we did manage to squeeze one of our Lenten soup suppers in before the pandemic forced us to cancel all our events. But I, for one, am sad that I will never taste Carolyn's corn pudding again because she and Paul will be moving in a few weeks. But I'll be forever grateful for having one serving. We were all looking forward to the spaghetti dinner to raise money for our youth scholarship fund. And we were all looking forward to our pancake breakfast on Palm Sunday. And I saw the Facebook picture some of you posted of the pancakes that you ate at home that morning. Those pictures and our sadness are a testament to how meals shared in the spirit of Jesus are never about the food. It's about the love, isn't it? And of course, the same goes for these virtual communion services that we've created for this time when physical interaction is restricted. And although we would much rather be together in the sanctuary tonight, we can rejoice that nothing can keep the Lord from feeding us, especially tonight, when we remember together that last meal Jesus shared with his disciples before he died on the cross for us, how before even the meal was over, he showed his disciples that what they were doing together at the table wasn't about what they were eating. It was about what we are all called to do when the meal is over. Because John's gospel tells us Jesus got up from the table and he showed his disciples that it's all about love. He wrapped a cloth around his waist, poured water into a basin and began to wash their feet, setting the example. 
and giving them a new commandment to become like him, to become love itself. So whenever we come to his table to break the bread and lift the cup, whether on this night, each year, or on every first Sunday of the month, whether we're in the sanctuary together, or whether we're together virtually from, my, from our homes, let's all remember what we are being fed to do, which is to get up from the table and by his grace, to love as he loves us. Because that way, everyone will see and know that we are his disciples. And so before we come to the table of love, we'll first listen together to our song of preparation. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. This is the table of the Lord from the night of his arrest until now his disciples have continued to come to the table for this holy meal as he did that night in Jerusalem Christ meets us here we are included in this feast whether we are filled with faith or emptied by doubt whether we are first among saints, last among scoundrels, or somewhere in between. In bread broken and cup poured out, we remember the full extent of Christ's love for us, and we give thanks. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you that you sent your son Jesus for the healing of the world, that we might learn to follow his life of humility and share in the joy of his glorious resurrection. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive now our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may become a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Unite us with Christ in his suffering that we may also know his glory and strengthen us to reveal your justice until all are made whole again in your kingdom without end. And we now pray the words your son taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life, take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. The cup of salvation, drink of it, all of you. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup from this cup, we remember the saving death of our Lord until he comes. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we rise from this table knowing a love beyond our deserving. Thank you for giving us a place at your table, for serving us the bread of life, for offering us the cup of salvation. In humility and hope, we go now from this night to your promised day of resurrection. Amen. Amen. And now go in peace. And may God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit guard, guide, and keep you this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.